Hey folks, it's Q&A time. 145. That's the episode number. And uh, here we are. Just, just, jumbled, the, just you know, the facts. Just, just, yeah, well, <laughs> just the actual facts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. We're going to start with this Q&A as we do every week with a question from the Discord server. They vote on their favorite their, the question that they most want answered this week, every every week. How many times did I say week? A lot. Uh, and it's not even every week because like we didn't do a Q and A last week or two weeks ago or something. And anyway, I feel like I'm lying. Lying is the new no. P h a c t s is the new lie. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Question from Discord this week. Could you do a small section on Hamiltonian spite? So when I first read that, I thought we were talking about Hamilton, the founding father. I was like, oh, I don't know. I didn't know he wrote about that. And I didn't realize that anyone really referred to um, spite. This is not about Hamilton and Burr. And... No. 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 It's, it's, it's about game theory and, um, and you know, prisoner's dilemma and spite versus altruism and all of this. So um, that is the reference. That is, it's W.D. Hamilton, not um, Alexander. Could you do a small section on Hamiltonian spite? It seems to be the driving force behind many conflicts, wokeness to some degree, the Ukraine war, the Ukraine war in particular. If you listen to Putin, Putin, no one pronounces it that way. If you listen to Putin's speeches when they are translated, he openly states his goals are to reshape the world order the West reigns over. To do that, he doesn't have to win. He has to lose less than the West does. That kind of hand also seems to yield an advantage to people who are less compassionate than their opponents. Wondering if you were seeing the same thing. So I will say, just before you start riffing, um, I, have not, I have actively been not paying a lot of attention to um, Ukraine and Putin or Putin. Um, but assuming that this is an accurate representation, um, I, I actually can't tell if this is the question asker or if Putin is saying, um, in order to reshape the world, order the West reigns over, he doesn't have to win, he ha has to lose less than the West does. Uh, that's not spite. That's just winning by a different name. Right? Like spite, right? Like the, if, if, you, if you win um, by losing less than your opponent, by, by knowing that you are seeking to lose less than your opponent, then that doesn't fall into that, that quadrant. Um, the uh, Punnett Square-like thing that you're drawing with regard to um, a, a dyadic game in which you can co you can both cooperate or you can both defect, or one of you can cooperate and defect, or the other one of you can defect and cooperate. Yes, my only concern about that, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to address the Ukraine thing. Uh, I don't understand the mapping, and I don't understand well enough what Putin is and isn't saying, and I know that I'm going through a translation filter, and so, you know, how accurate is it? Mm -hmm. uh, there are too many layers of uncertainty there. Okay. Um, I will say, Hamiltonian spite is a very important concept to understand. It's actually very simple, and it's not um, exotic. And I think, I think we may have actually talked about this in a previous... Uh, podcast somewhere, but it doesn't matter. Uh, let's put it this way. It is easy to understand when a person behaves in a way that provides the person choosing to behave in this way an advantage and also provides another person an advantage, right? Even a selfish individual will do things from which they get an advantage, irrespective of whether or not they provide an advantage for another person, irrespective of whether that's the intent. Mm -hmm. um, a person can also be easily understood when they do something that provides them, the person choosing to do the action, with an advantage, and it disadvantages somebody else. It's a standard competition, for example. Uh, you would advantage yourself at cost to somebody else. Um, it is... Um, Altruism, if you take a disadvantage to provide an advantage to somebody else, there are reasons that this does evolve. The most obvious one is that your degree of relatedness means that your genes are doing themselves a favor, even if you as an individual are suffering a cost to deliver a benefit to somebody else. Parenthood follows this 
model. Um, we suffer costs as parents to advantage our children. And the reason that we do this, evolutionarily speaking, is uh, because that's because genes that cause us to uh, view the world this way um, are passed on frequently. The quadrant that is difficult to explain you go is... check that out. Thanks. The quadrant that is difficult to explain is... Okay, can I, can I, I'm sorry, I was distracted by the strange animal noises coming from outside. Um, <clears throat> so what you were talking about with regard to... Um, oh, God, it's Fairfax in a tree. I don't know whether that requires our attention. Let's assume it does not okay. until we find out that it does. Okay, so... Uh, inclusive fitness being um, the form of altruism in which you are doing something that benefits your kin. Um, and there's also, of course, basically um, a, a situation in which you are social and have long-standing social interactions in which it may appear that you are just um, being altruistic, but there is, um, you know, barn building being the example that um, Dick Alexander used to to give primarily, uh, you know, if 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 you are asked over and over again to help your neighbors build barns, that does not necessarily mean that you are um, an altruist or a fool. Uh, it does mean that at the point that it's time to build a barn on your property, you expect rightfully uh, that others will come and join in. Yeah, so there are a bunch of different uh, categories of altruism that are easily explained. One of them is reciprocal altruism. Another is indirect reciprocity, which is what you have just described, in which you invest in a system in which you take more out than you have invested. And so it's net beneficial, even if you don't uh, get your uh, favor from the same people to whom you did a favor. Um, all these things are relatively comprehensible. The perplexing one that the, the question here is targeted at yep. is when you accept a cost to deliver a cost. Why would you ever accept a cost to harm someone else? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, there's a very good ev evolutionary reason to do this, and many of the most important features of civilization actually depend on it being done. And the point is, when somebody is not behaving according to the rules that govern some collective, the rules that a lineage abides by, for example, then if they profit in doing so, then their betrayal of the collective will uh, be favored by selection. And so it will happen increasingly much. So in order for that not to be true, what you have to do is change the calculus for the person who has betrayed the collective so that it did not turn out to be right. net beneficial. Right. And what this means is you will, for example, um, let's say that your child has misbehaved in a supermarket and you yell at the child in such a way that makes you ugly in the eyes of others in order that the child feels humiliated so the child will not do this in the future. The point is you have accepted the cost of schooling the child. Likewise, and the most obvious example of spite in this sense, which is to accept a cost in order to deliver a cost, is policing. Mm -hmm. That we um, pay to have a police force that makes it expensive to commit crime. Right? Mm -hmm. How expensive? Well, ideally what you want to do is invest enough that crime doesn't pay. If crime doesn't pay, then uh, you don't expect to see it flourish and spread, right? If you want crime to, it'll never be zero. But the point is anybody who engages in crime, if on average they do worse because they engaged in crime, they will find productive things to do. If they sometimes come out ahead because they've engaged in crime, such that that can be a viable niche, then you expect to see it. So we collectively have to invest enough in inflicting costs, that is to say, in policing and prisons and other forms of punishment, such that crime doesn't pay, and that's what drives crime down. I mean, it may be, so the, the connection that you're making there between policing and spite and this rendering of, of Putin 
perhaps just looking to reframe the world, even if his own country comes out less well ahead by most standard metrics, um, is interesting because it all def relies on there being some other measure by which the individual who is losing is actually getting something out of the situation. Well, I don't think it can be the correct interpretation if if Russia actually loses or can be expected to lose. Right. Russia has but to if, win. But if they, if, if they gain, if they gain by reframing uh, the world order. If they gain in the long e term. Even, even if uh, they experience an immediate economic downturn and there are sanctions because everyone hates Russia now and all of this. Uh, then that is that is a win, and there's so you know there's not only a temporal uh, uh, axis to consider, but also a actually maybe the values that you are measuring spite on aren't the same values that the actor is measuring them on. Well, you get into a difficult problem when um, the two parties are working in a different currency. We sometimes saw this. Uh, there's a documentary whose so name you're not, I have. You're not for, talking about monetary currency. You're talking about metaphorical currency. Whatever they value. Yeah. Um, there was a a documentary about um, I don't even remember exactly. It was loosely about atheism that included uh, Dawkins. I think Dawkins was sort of the central focus of the documentary, and I remember a case in which he was arguing with a creationist, and you know, from the perspective of a rationalist materialist, Dawkins was thrashing this guy just mercilessly. But from the point of view of this guy's constituency, it was quite the opposite. Dawkins was making a fool out of himself. Mm -hmm. And so in that case, it's very hard to know how to evaluate. You know, both, it makes yeah. sense that both parties would choose to engage in that debate because nobody lost. The, everybody played to their own audience and won. Yeah. And... Uh, you know, so anyway, what does one make of that? It's not hard to explain why a person uh, would cater to their own. I mean, I'm not arguing that Dawkins was doing anything cynical. I think Dawkins yep. was doing exactly what he does earnestly. But in this case, it was just apparent that as much as to Dawkins, it felt like he was delivering this guy a painful loss. That was not what was going on. Interesting. Um, yeah. So anyway, I would say that, you know, the calculus of spite requires that you are suffering a cost in terms that you recognize in order to deliver a cost to somebody in terms they recognize in order to shape their behavioral landscape so they stop engaging in some behavior that they engaged in before. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, th that is a perfectly plausible interpretation. I do, f whatever Putin may be, I do think he is um, a Russian patriot, right? I do think he wants, but whether yes. that's, yeah, whether it's for selfish reasons or not, whether he yep. wants his legacy to be improving the, the standing of Russia in, you know, in the world, um, as long as that's what he's doing and the point is I'm willing to suffer costs in order to get there, then yeah, that's following um, the Hamiltonian spite doesn't mean, you know, obviously there's a question about I'm choosing to engage in this behavior because I expect this to be the result of it. doesn't mean that that is what the result of it is. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be that Russia ends up way behind as a result of this action, even though uh, the people, in this case, the person who chose to take the action, expect it otherwise. Yep. Good. Next question. All right. The discussion of gender dysphoria as an ancient problem not traditionally treated by medically transitioning raises a conundrum. How does one evaluate medical interventions through an evolutionary lens? Modern medicine saves lives that would have been lost. How to tell what is beneficial versus counterintuitive? And then this person has another question. In the spirit of Chesterton's fence, what are your thoughts on Bill Gates' intention to eradicate mosquitoes? Deepest respects. I've learned so much from the both of you. Uh, let me start with, with the eradication of mosquitoes thing, yep. which I think we have talked about before. I didn't actually know it was part of the, the Gates goal, um, but I've heard it from a variety of people. Uh, and every time I hear it, I think, I wonder if the person saying it has any idea how many species of mosquitoes there are. And I'm pretty sure that I've never heard this proposed by someone who actually understands 
biology at a level that would be warranted to make such a claim. Um, you know, like I don't, I don't think that these claims of bringing back the woolly mammoth are legit for different reasons, but at least the woolly mammoth was a species, right? Um, that does have a close, close issue. You don't with think it's relative. acceptable to do it, or you don't think it's plausible? I didn't say acceptable. I, I don't think you said legit. I'm just trying yeah. to figure out what you mean. Um, I, I don't think it's going to happen. I, I, I think when you look at what they're actually claiming to do, yeah, uh, they're they're not. Oh. Um, cool stuff happening out the window. Yep. Um, um, I just, I, when you actually look at what they're doing, they're not actually talking about bringing back the woolly mammoth. That's, so I, I, I question those claims for different reasons um, than, oh, what we need to do is eradicate the mosquito. The mosquito, not a thing. So there is a clay to mosquitoes, also pretty speciose, um, Anopheles that are in fact responsible for vectoring most of the diseases that are known to be mosquito vectored. I think Aedes, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, A-E-D-E-S, is another smaller clade of mosquitoes that also vectors some. But Anopheles vector uh, malaria and dengue and yellow fever and Zika and on and on and on and on, a bunch more that I'm just not remembering at the moment. And I don't know how you would, but at the very least, any any proposal that begins with eradicate the mosquito has revealed such a naivete about what is actually going on that you should not trust those people. Right. But even, we don't even know whether or not this is the Gates Foundation saying eradicate the mosquito or this is somebody uh, doing shorthand on... Sure. You know. I, and, I, and I'm not making, I'm not taking a position on that. So that's, that's point one is that if someone does say, oh, we just want to eradicate the mosquito, then you, you know, you know that they don't really know they, what they, they're talking about. I've heard people say eradicate, it would it be all right to eradicate mosquitoes? That's what they say, which is tantamount to the same thing. It's the same thing. Yeah. From, from my perspective, it's the same thing. Um, if you were able to collapse it down to still a gigantically large number of individuals and still a fairly large number of species of mosquitoes that are actually known to vector diseases that, um, that cause a tremendous amount of human um, disease and death, I'm still not sure you should, and I'm specifically not sure you can, but at least now we're in the realm of maybe we can talk about this. Now, I, what I don't know... I don't know a lot of things, but one thing I don't know is in those places where Anopheles exist, for instance, in um, tropical Latin America, um, where there are all of those diseases um, that are vectored by, um, by Anopheles mosquitoes, I don't know what fraction of the biomass of mosquitoes is made up by Anopheles. So the fact is that bats and other insectivorous animals, um, including many birds, rely on mosquitoes um, to exist. And if you take out a giant chunk, then you're starting to lose insectivorous um, birds and bats, and then you're starting to lose the organisms that eat those, and you know pretty soon you have a trophic cascade that has collapsed. If Anopheles are 2% of the biomass of the mosquitoes in the places where they exist, maybe you could do that without effect. Maybe not. How is it that we are actually supposed to make these assessments? Um, it's it's entirely going to be theoretical models because you can't actually do it unless you've done it, and then um, then you've got a, potentially a problem. So I I, wor I worry about interventions like this. But yeah, I worry about them too. Uh, I think I worry about them less because I think you know this strikes me as the hubris that nature always teaches us we're not going to be able to do it right you're not yeah. going to be able to do it doesn't mean you won't do tremendous harm in the attempt yeah but look uh, there are several dimensions here that i want to just point out yeah. need to be explored and even to begin to answer the question of whether this would be a reasonable thing to attempt one is what would the net effect be on human suffering i don't know you know we have an overly simplistic view of the universe. A huge number of people die of malaria and yellow fever and other diseases borne by Anopheles mosquitoes. If you eliminate those mosquitoes and therefore presumably those diseases, what happens to those people? Presumably different people die of different things. Does the human population go up because fewer people are dying of malaria, or does starvation go up because there are more mouths to feed because you haven't addressed 
you've addressed the malaria problem and but you've you know it's an open equation mm-hmm. so i don't you know from the point of view of are you willing to end a clade of mosquitoes to decrease human suffering and death of course is that the effect that would come from eliminating those mosquitoes no clue could be worse is that the so effect like it's two sides are you capable of doing that thing and if you could do that thing, would it accomplish the goal that you said that you're trying to obtain? <clears throat> and the answer to both of those questions may be no. Right. Yeah. Also, what kind of harm? I mean, we've watched um, absolute numbskulls double down so many times on their idiotic plans surrounding COVID. Yep. One of those numbskulls being the very same numbskull in question here with respect to dealing with Anopheles mosquitoes. Right. Right? So the point is, okay, suppose we grant that you should eliminate Anopheles mosquitoes, and then you try, and lo and behold, evolution is quicker than you are, and it doesn't work. And so you start turning up the dose of whatever you're using, or the intensity of the attack, or whatever it is you're doing. At what point do we, able to, do we get to say, look, you were a dummy for thinking you could do that and you're doing all of this harm in the attempt and it isn't working, you know, how much cost are you inflicting on the world for your, uh, for your arrogance? So before you continue, I want to come back also to the first part of this question, but the very next question actually is re- relevant to where you were just going, which is the brown stink bug has invaded the Pacific Northwest this year um, and, and this year is the worst yet. Scientists talk of releasing samurai wasps to combat them. Will more invasive species migrate and does introducing a non-native predator work? So this is the same sort of like, okay, we're going to do this thing, are we going to do this other thing to correct the failures or the not quite living up to potential of the first intervention? Yeah. On first off, on. every one of these instances in which you get clever about, oh, we'll release the so-and-so to catch the such-and-such doesn't work. I don't know right? why she swallowed the fly. Right. Manatees didn't control hydrilla in the Panama Canal. Yeah. Uh, mongoose didn't control rats in Jamaica. This never freaking works. Now, it's not to say that there's no plan that could work, but the basic problem is anytime you do this, you get a predator-prey oscillation, right? Mm-hmm. As the prey becomes sufficiently rare, the predator g- gets rare because it's got nothing to eat, either that or it's eating something else you didn't want it to. And so... It's not a good plan. Yeah, which, there... is, which is often what happens. You bring in this predator, like, well, and it's native habitat. It loves this. Like, well, it's a native habitat. It doesn't have filet mignon. Hey, look what it's got here. Right. So it starts taking off. The, so the newly introduced thing um, leaves the original introduced thing alone, which then thrives. And this now opens up more niche for that guy because it's now eating a bunch of the native um, prey items. Yeah. yeah. So, look, invasive species are a problem. We do it terrible job of controlling them the way to deal with it is to control them and then coming in after the fact with your clever pesticide or predator or whatever it is yeah. is uh it's a sign that you've lost um it's not to say that there's no case where it has worked but it, it you got to have a really good plan yeah. um the other thing i would say though is let's say that you found that anopheles mosquitoes were a significant fraction of the mosquito biomass in some habitat. Yeah. Well, A, Which you've they got be. they might be. Yeah. But B, most likely thing that happens if you were to push a button and have them disappear is a bunch of things that they were out competing grow in other genera of mosquitoes fill the niche. Or it might not be mosquitoes, but the point is, will you change the admixture of the vertebrates? Yes, you will. If what you've done is introduced a pesticide that goes after Anopheles mosquitoes and is not terrifically targeted in some way that pesticides never are, plausible you could, but if you pesticide your way towards the elimination of the Anopheles mosquitoes, I think you will see an environmental catastrophe, but it won't be a lack of mosquito catastrophe, it will be a pollutant catastrophe. So what you're arguing is, if if you could... If we could successfully target Anopheles mosquitoes only and uh, and otherwise leave the ecosystem unperturbed, that something would fill that Anopheles niche without inherently being a vector for yellow fever, or dengue, or malaria or anything. Absolutely. Um, which then perhaps 
the bats who were eating the mosquitoes, the birds who eating the mosquitoes could eat or not as well. And so you'd get selection on the bats to move into a slightly different morphology to better eat the new thing that's in the space. Or you get some of those bats dying off and being replaced by different bats who um, are better at doing yeah. something else. Ultimately, you've got trophic levels and you've got yeah. a certain amount of productivity. And then at each level of the trophic hierarchy, you've got some number of critters profiting as much as can be done off of the level below it and uh so something's gonna fill it and it could make you a lot less happy or it could you know be delightful yeah. and if if you could magically go like anopheles is gone like no no toxins no right. no nothing if if yeah. there was an anopheles gone button would it be worth risking pushing it i think absolutely mm. does that mean it would be okay in the end no it might be a negative change on the other hand but you think that risk would be worth taking if Even it, though if it was truly an anopheles gone, thing. if it was an anopheles gone button with no other consequences, then yes, mm -hmm. I don't trust the people who formulate these plans. They claim they have such buttons, and they don't. Right. Um, yes, that's exactly right. But what I would, and I fully acknowledge that there there is a risk that you eliminate the anopheles mosquitoes, you eliminate the malaria, and the amount of human suffering goes up because right. you didn't understand that as bad as malaria is, that the number of people who were going to die of something was close to fixed and you changed what they died of and it, it was worse, yep. right? Um, that's possible. So I would say even given that risk, I still think the chances that you improve overall human well-being by eliminating malaria would be worth the risk of altering the habitats in which these mosquitoes exist. But all of that said, I do think there is an overarching way to do this properly. And it makes almost everybody uh, at least annoyed at me. This argument is very annoying, and I get why it is. But the argument is this. The only actually grounded way to decide what we shouldn't and shouldn't do is to forego the idea that other creatures have rights and calculate everything backwards from human well-being, mm. right? Now, I know that this is a terrible, terrible argument because when I look at an orca or an elephant or a chimpanzee or a gorilla or a lion or a wolf or any of those other creatures and I hear that they don't have the right to exist, that it's all about us, I know that there's something morally offensive about that. However... My point would be, as soon as you say, well, the right of orcas to exist is obvious, so we must defend it, then you get immediately to the question of, well, why doesn't malaria have a right to exist, right? What, where are you going to draw the line of which creatures do have a right to exist and which creatures are we allowed to get rid of, right? And my point is that is a fool's paradise, where you were going to end up in a bunch of arguments, we don't have the information in order to draw the lines cleanly. And so, the surprising thing is if you say, well, human well-being is the thing to maximize, but you do it right. And the point is, not just current human beings, but human beings forever, indefinitely into the future. Do those human beings have a right to see orcas, or do we have the right to exterminate the orcas or behave in ways that will result in the elimination of the orca? Absolutely, those future humans have the right to a world with orcas in it, and rhinoceroses, and gorillas, and wolves, and all those other creatures. Do they have a right uh, to a world with Anopheles mosquitoes? Well, no. Presumably, Anopheles mosquitoes are not going to become a benefit to humans. The only way that they're a benefit to humans is if the ways that people die get worse if you eliminate those mosquitoes, which we don't have reason to think is true. So the point is, if you want to figure out what, what, shouldn't, what should and what should we not do, the line is, do you have enough information to assert from the present position in history that a certain change will be a net benefit to humanity, which we will assume is indefinitely long-lived? right? If the answer to that is yes, then that's a change worth gambling on. If the answer to that is no, the risks are that we will make life worse and that life will be permanently worse because you will eliminate orcas and every human generation from now on will live without them and that will be very bad, 
right? Then you don't make the change. And this is not, an, you know, I guess the point is my instincts as a bleeding heart liberal, that there are creatures that we ought to protect for their own sake and that habitats are beautiful and we ought to protect them and that we ought to be very cautious about changes that we're going to make, thinking we're going to improve things. All of those values are actually protected best when you say human well-being in the long term is the only parameter to maximize, but you have to do so in a wise way in which you do not make stupid changes that turn out to create unintended consequences right? You have to be certain enough of your ability to do X and not do other things that are, are going to swamp out that benefit. All of the values that I hold dear are actually best protected by this one annoying uh, shift to actually human well-being is the only thing we should be paying attention to. Well, as you know, I don't like it, but I don't have anything better. So that's where we are. That's where I've been when I've heard you give that before. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's where I am too. I don't like it either, but, yep. uh, but I don't have anything better. Okay. So as for the first part of the question, how does one evaluate medical interventions by an evolutionary lens? Um, we go into this a fair bit in must be like chapters three and four of hunter gatherers guide to the 21st century. Um, and, you know, Darwinian medicine briefly seemed like it was going to be created and, and have a, have a place, you know, it would be, Evolutionary thinking would be taught in medical schools. Uh, following the publication of the Williams and Nessie book, um, "Why We Get Sick." Why we get sick? That's it. In like 1994, something like that. Um, and then it just—I mean, that book's still great, and it's classic now. And it needs a bunch more updates and a bunch more people thinking that way. And there are a few, uh, but by and large, medical schools don't have anything about thinking evolutionarily and frankly all you have to do is go on the site of the AMA or the American Association of Pediatrics or the endocrine whatever any of these people and you see very clear evidence that uh, I mean to hell with thinking evolutionarily they can't even think scientifically so I mean it's a really shouldn't be a high bar at all to expect people who you want to help you live a long and healthy life to understand something about where you came from for those hundreds of millions of years. But nope, can't do that. No, sir. So uh, anyway, we, we go into it a bit and, and go through some of the mistakes that um, Western medicine has made through a combination largely of hubris and reductionism and over-reliance on, on scientism and over-reliance on technology. Yeah, and in the modern era, over-reliance on Fauci is not helping. No, it's really not. Um, yeah. 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 So we're long ways in, and we've only done two questions. Yeah. I would Actually, just say, no, it's three. It's three. The problem, <laughs> as uh, Steve Patterson points out, at the root of a huge number of failed fields is an underappreciation of complexity. And I would argue the reason we underappreciate complexity is that we succeeded in science in the simple fields first. Simple doesn't mean easy to understand, but simple means fundamental, right? And because we succeeded in physics and chemistry first, we are late to the game with respect to complex systems. And when you're in a complex system and you've got something functional, you ought to be very cautious about disrupting it. And you ought to be very careful to monitor the cascading effects that flow from whatever alteration it is. And that's true whether you're talking about habitats, as we were with the Anopheles mosquitoes, or the intervention in a body with medicine. The, the best policy is intervene as little as you can. And that's how you should evaluate these things. The fact is delaying an intervention and looking skeptically at it when you don't know very much about what its actual implication is, uh, is enough to get you there. And then when you realize that we know for sure that you are interfering with normal reproductive structures, the basic point is, look, these interventions, to the extent that they interfere with those things, are a violation of the Hippocratic Oath, pure and simple. Why are we suddenly so comfortable? Why do we not even mention the Hippocratic Oath when talking about these interventions? So the question was not about trans in particular at all, I don't think. 
Mm. Sorry, I inferred that medicine. somewhere. Um, oh no, no, it did ask about that. It okay. asked about in the context of uh, the interventions that we were discussing in the main podcast. But anyway, now, the gender assigned at birth may be a perversion of and God said. James Lindsay and others have noted that the God of this new religion is one's self. Thoughts? That's fascinating. I had not heard James say that. I've not, I've not heard that before. Um, that does sound like his kind of insight. Um, and it also fits really well with uh, Aaron Reich's observations that we were, that I was reading from in the first hour about um, the rise in sort of the focus on self and frankly, becoming disembodied um, around, you know, the early modern age and, um, and that fitting with also a rise in depression. Uh, it's fascinating. I hadn't, I hadn't heard this before. Yeah, there's something to it. I think there's also something to the idea. Um, it's amazing how frequently somebody who has an organic mental disorder like a, a very serious one like schizophrenia, mm -hmm. will conclude that they are in fact an agent of God or that they are, you know, Jesus returned or something like this. And I'm wondering if there's not, at the point that the your evaluative structures have mm -hmm. failed sufficiently, if you don't have a hemorrhage of overfitting, where the idea is you start validating a worldview in which you have tremendous capacity of insight and the power to alter things that a mortal wouldn't think they had the power to alter. That basically the postmodernism leads you to, if, you, if, you, if you're not grounded by something, it leads you to a... Um, an absurd level of belief in your own comprehension and uh, insight. And that that's not, I think that's effectively synonymous with what it sounds like James is arguing. Oh, I don't think so. I don't think it's synonymous at all, actually. I was going to say, I think that yours is an individual level argument and his is a population level argument. If, if I understand what is being said here, Karelka, that the god of this new religion is oneself. So he's talking about you know, the understanding that what is taking over is this sort of wokeness, this ideology, whatever, at, at a religion level. And you're talking about sort of the psychological thing that can happen <clears throat> to people as they experience X, Y, or Z, be it um, organic mental disorder or, you know, looking at oneself in the mirror too long or being too much on TikTok or whatever it is. So that's curious because the idea that the god of this new religion is self, you're, you're making self like your culture. No. Because you said that I was making it an individual level thing and you thought that James was... Because he's taught, Because this appears to be about the religion. about the, the, the A religion that has as many gods as there are members. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, but I, I think there's something, there's something interesting here without... I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sure how deep it might go because I guess it, it, re, it will require... Uh, pinpointing like okay where do you want to stand to assess this do you want to stand at the individual and try to understand the psychology do you want to stand at the level of society and say i want to understand how this really how this new religion really has taken over but we have yeah a lot more questions so let's proceed um i need dating advice not for me but for my nephews who are college aged it seems like the girls they meet are woke and entitled what advice do you what advice do you give to your boys uh, well, among other things, uh, one of ours is sitting right here producing the podcast, <laughs> so I have to adhere to what advice, advice I've, you give me? <laughs> yeah, I would say the, the advice I believe I have given Zach and Toby is A, that they should, that the rarity of people who have the characteristics one would want in a mate is sufficient that you should be very careful not to assume, oh, you're going to date for a while and then you'll settle down, you'll find somebody, blah, blah, blah. You never know when you're going to meet that person and don't fuck it up because it, the, the worthy mates are not a commodity at this point. They really aren't. 
Maybe they never were, but they aren't now. That's for sure. I have said never consider um, marrying somebody who does not have a sense of humor about themselves. That sense of humor about oneself is so important to navigate the difficulties of forging a relationship with somebody that it is an absolute deal breaker if somebody doesn't have it, no matter what other characteristics they may have. Um, I would add, because this is specifically saying the girls they meet are woke and entitled, and yep, uh, but people who know how to do real physical things in the universe are less likely to be woke and entitled, at least at a global scale. So um, meeting people on an adventure, you know, backpacking, hiking, or learning a physical skill like carpentry or mechanics or you know something. Um, any anyone who is who is willingly and is interestedly engaging in such things is going to have a very hard time hanging tight to their wokeness at least at least across all domains yep um, yeah and I would say a corollary of that is spend as much time as you can in those activities that would reveal those kinds of instincts and skills it, it's you know it's like the opposite of a uh, a singles bar right spending time in the activities where you might meet somebody who has the characteristics that make sense um is uh, good it's a little bit like it's tough though i mean precisely for for young men um because the activities that we're talking about um, are now and have historically been more likely to be of interest to young men. Right? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, the sex ratio is going to be pretty skewed um, to start. Yep. So that means be awesome so that that sex ratio is not an obstacle to winning the heart of the right person. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I would also just add, this is not directly responsive, but I would also say um, uh, among the pieces of advice I know I've given, um, don't sleep with people that you know are not marriage material, which doesn't mean that you're expecting to marry somebody at the point that you go to bed with them, but it means that it's not cool going to bed with somebody who's already, uh, for whom you already know that there's a deal breaker. All right, next question. Um, Tesla has a question. Yes, he has many questions. How much have you two thought about suing YouTube or at least filing FOIA requests regarding your demonetization? Government apparently had a hand in censorship at Twitter, maybe here too. I have no doubt that the government had a hand, and I have no doubt that in a world in which courts still functioned properly that the revelations that would flow from discovery would benefit the world and would uh, restore our ability to earn that would be very positive. The problem is you are talking about a landscape that is heavily stacked in favor of a corporation that you know, not only can spend indefinitely much to make sure the effort comes to nothing, uh, but has a permanent legal staff of gargantuan size. It's not to say that a, an effort couldn't be won, but it's to say uh, in signing up for such a thing, one has to do so very soberly. So believe me, I believe they are absolutely vulnerable on a, on a level playing field, this would be the obvious remedy. The playing field isn't level and that makes it a different calculation, but no, it's very much on the table. Um, this is an observation with a link that we have not gone to. I watched a Cooper's hawk take a flicker and two pileated woodpeckers came and harassed the Cooper's hawk. Wow. And um, <clears throat> he's got a link on Flickr, spelled differently, um, 
the video. Altruism, reciprocal altruism, question mark. That's well, amazing. Yeah. So just for those for those who don't know birds at all, flicker flicker's a woodpecker. Flickers and pileated woodpeckers are pretty closely related. Um, but not the same species, obviously. Yeah, I don't know that they're, I bet they're not closely related within woodpeckers, but both being woodpeckers. Oh, I think th they're relative. I mean, all the all the northern temperate woodpeckers are fairly close because uh, they're just... I will be shocked if flickers and, and uh, pileators are close, but it, it doesn't really matter. That That is pretty clearly not what's going on. Yeah. Um, no, I, I wasn't suggesting this was some kind of inclusive fitness thing. Yep. Yeah. So, all right, let's, let's put a couple things on the table here. One, there's a very interesting phenomenon called predator inspection, which causes creatures, when one creature is captured by a predator... I would just like it noted that Tesla did not make that happen. No, he didn't. Um, he, he may have willed it to happen. Yeah, I mean, he's being opportunistic now, but he didn't, he didn't ask for that. But when a creature is captured by a predator, other similar creatures will often show up to see what's happening. And this makes a brutal kind of sense. If you want to know, if you want to develop a search image for the thing that threatens you, if you want to have information about what it eats, seeing it provides that. So this has interesting ramifications. Back when I was doing bat work, it was well known that you might have a net that you had placed, a mist net, and it might be getting little or no traffic, and then a bat would fly into it, start screaming, and then suddenly it would fill with bats, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Other bats were coming to look. Um, so that does not get to the answer to your question. If the pileated were actually harassing the predator, then that's different than investigating it. It's not an informational thing. They're actually taking a risk to inflict a cost. Um, there are relationships. I know of nothing in the neighborhood of flickers and pileated woodpeckers, but there are things like mixed foraging flocks in which birds will uh, travel together. Multiple species of birds will travel together and forage together. Typically, this works best if they eat different things. So you can imagine that if you ate insects, but you ate different insects than some other bird, then the size of the flock provides some protection. The extra eyes that come from another animal that can see a predator and may have different visual acuity provides some safety. So there's lots of reasons that different species might gather together to forage and get an advantage from larger numbers of individuals from other species being present. One could imagine, therefore, that if the pileated and the flicker were getting an advantage from foraging together, which they might because they do eat different things, that uh, the pileated, if it could relatively safely punish the predator into releasing the flicker, if that flicker is a flicker that those particular pileated woodpeckers have been traveling with, then there's an a selfish reason they might do it. Um, it could be that there's an argument. If you imagine that this predator, Sorry, I was doing uh, woodpecker for Lajney. Sorry. If you imagine <laughs> that this predator is one that's going to stick around where it's making a profit, and the pileateds have a nest with chicks in it, and therefore making driving the predator's profit. Uh, you know, so it's in the it's in the red uh, would cause it to move on to a different habitat, and the chicks of the pileateds would therefore have an advantage. You could imagine it making sense in those ways. So anyway, I don't know that any of these things are what's going on, but my only point is that proof of concept wise, there are a number of ways you could get to it being in the interest of the pileated woodpeckers to punish or harm the predator that was. Uh, eating a flicker um, in their own territory. And those hypotheses make predictions too. Indeed. Um, so I c can't, in the amount of time I had, figure out exactly how close they are, but um, 
the genus that pileatids are in and the genus that flickers are in are in a tribe uh, that is five genera strong within woodpeckers. So they're not that distant within woodpeckers, but I don't know how many species each of those each of those genera have. Got but it. anyway, I, I did not mean to suggest that there was <clears throat> this is going to be about inclusive fitness. Just it's interesting that it's a woodpecker that got taken and two larger bodied woodpeckers came and um, harassed the predator. Yep. Seems PayPal is switching accountability to the stakeholders as opposed to the shareholders. ESG question mark. I don't know what that means. I noticed PayPal was the only option here to submit. Will you add other options? I'm closing out PayPal. So that's a question about specifically the Q&A. Yeah. Platform. Well, I think if PayPal does not relent, we're going to have to figure out some way uh, to avoid using them. And frankly, it makes sense for their business to evaporate upon taking such an egregiously stupid and immoral position. Yep. Um, the other question, I guess, was ESG... Um, what is that? What is that? I have for? forgotten what it's. It's an acronym for environmental sustainably sustainability and yeah. Zach, one of you is going to have it here in a second. Uh, environmental, social, social, and governance. Yeah. So it's a score, I think, um, that is being touted as mm -hmm. yep. advancing socially responsible capitalism. It is, of course. Uh, a scourge, <laughs> and uh, it is one of these utterly ironic phenomena that is going to make the world worse and not better. Um, but yes, in some sense, however this is working, if this is an internal mob that's getting PayPal to do something fiscally stupid because nobody will take responsibility for telling uh, the woke mob inside PayPal to go to hell, um, or if it is PayPal trying to earn an ESG score for some fashionable purpose in the market. I, I don't know. But yes, it's right. something in that neighborhood. Next question. In my understanding, both mRNA and classical vaccines work by making the body produce viral proteins, which then trigger an immune response. Why is one riskier than the other? Because that's not how classical vaccines work. Vaccines, classical vaccines don't quote, make the body produce viral proteins. They introduce uh, viral proteins, for instance, or entire viruses or you know, whatever it is um, <clears throat> uh, that you are trying to develop an immunity against, um, that itself triggers the immune response. So making your body into a factory that produces uh, the pathogen is quite different from introducing small amounts of the pathogen, either um, intact or not itself. Yeah, I can make, uh, I, I can steel man the argument um, in the sense the that... The argument that classical vaccines make the body produce viral proteins? Yeah, because okay. a live attenuated does in a sense. A live attenuated um, basically uses a, a real virus to um, infect cells that then produce... Um, I still wouldn't... Making the body produce like... Uh, allowing the body to be a host to a pathogen. Yep. Look, th there's no question that these vaccines are radically different, and they are radically different in several ways, and there's a distinction between the DNA version and the RNA version. Um, the turning your cells into a factory for a viral protein is utterly novel. Yeah. Turning your cells into a factory for a, vir for a viral protein that is itself cytotoxic is mind-bogglingly stupid. Um, you could say that. You And I have, and I've been accused of misinformation for claiming that this thing is cytotoxic, but it obviously is, which is now well known. Um, but nonetheless, point being, there is much that is different here. Let's take the mRNA version of this. The mRNAs are A, hyper-stabilized with pseudouridines, meaning that the normal process by which mRNAs are taken apart does not function normally, which but makes the it... Normal, the normal mechanisms by which the body would dismantle mRNAs that it found floating uh, in the intercellular fluid. Right, or would mm -hmm. take apart mRNAs uh, 
in the cytoplasm of a cell, right? These, these are not supposed to be long-lived molecules. Oh, or, oh yes, right. Okay. Um, they have been made very long-lived, which is having uh, many effects that are probably related to the syndromes that people are getting uh, after mRNA vaccination. What's more, the lipid nanoparticle mechanism for getting the mRNAs into cells in the first place have no targeting mechanism. And the fact that they are not targeted by remaining in the part of the body where they're injected means that this is just a, it's haphazardly introducing mRNAs into cells around the body that then become uh, uh, antigen factories, which then causes the body to react to them in an immune fashion that presumably results in the destruction of those cells. It's really an insane plan. So that's a little bit related to this question. Uh, um, have you seen the COVID vaccines under a microscope? Which I have, actually have not. What's your opinion on nanotech found in vials compared to scientific literature on nanotech? I think what's probably being said is that there's a cartoon version of the thing, and then there's what you actually get in some vial mm -hmm. that came off some assembly line uh, and has been shaken around and exposed to who knows what. And the basic point is you've got a slurry in which some of the things probably look something like what's in the brochure. Mm -hmm. But um, you're injecting, all, you know, just as you may have an idealized sense of what's in an oil deposit that then results in you getting uh, gasoline and all of the other things that fractionation produces, an oil deposit is a slurry of every conceivable organic compound you could get from taking yeah, those. It doesn't come out pre-fractionated. Yeah, it's pretty messy yeah. with a lot of pollutant from any perspective. So yeah, I don't, uh, look, the more one understands about especially the mRNA version of these vaccines, the more alarming the plan is. Mm -hmm. um, there's as soon as you know that the protein in question is bioactive, that it's going to be produced arbitrarily in the body because the lipid nanoparticles don't have a targeting mechanism, uh, that the lipid nanoparticles themselves have a chemical implication in the body that is not positive, as soon as you know how radical this plan was, it's a non-starter. Right, it's hard to imagine the uh, scenario in which it would have been worth taking an experimental medication like this. The DNA ones better because they have a targeting mechanism, but and they they don't have mRNA, so it's not stabilized with pseudouridine. That's two arguments in its favor. On the other hand, it does produce a cytotoxic antigen by hijacking your cells and you know it's it's leaps and bounds better without being anywhere near good yep which isn't to say this wasn't brilliant it was brilliant it just this stuff was not ready to be injected <laughs> into a human <clears throat> yep you've said that trans exists historically doesn't this just boil down to people dressing and acting in nonconformist ways? Surgical harm aside, is trans and queer just the new punk goth? But I think there are a number of things, and um, you know, lumping it all into trans doesn't do justice to all of them. And you know, we we have been consistent and persistent in saying sort of true trans and trans rights activists, and this is the vast majority of who we're hearing from now. And you, the question asker, are saying, yeah, but over in true trans area, isn't, isn't it mostly just being a nonconformist? And I do think there's, there's some of that, um, but there's also some, you know, some known, um, actually, genetic anomalies, which, and, you know, this, this is where actually trans and, and intersex actually do combine into something related to one another where uh, you can have a genetic condition where you are born I don't know if there these actually exist going both directions but um, you know, you're born very much looking like one sex and then when puberty hits it becomes clear that you are actually going to manifest as, as the other and um, that is that is about a genetic slash developmental anomaly that you had nothing to do with and you have no choice in uh, so that's not just 
um, dressing and acting in nonconformist ways. The, you know, there are pockets, I believe, you know, there's one of these that I've written about um, that exists in Haiti, I believe it is, or is it Dominican Republic? I can't remember which. Um, one, one of the countries on Hispaniola, um, there is a village with a high rate of this genetic anomaly um, that results in it being, you know, machiembras, uh, you know, the boy, boy girls, ma men, women. And that's not just about being a nonconformist. Right? Yeah. Um, that said, how much of how much of people really feeling that they are they need to present to the world in a different way uh, could just as well have manifested as and you know I'm just always going to wear purple or something. Um, maybe there's some of that too. Uh, I also suspect that if science and medicine writes itself and we actually have good solid research going forward uh, that we are likely to learn uh, that there are some effects uh, perhaps dramatic of environmental uh, hormones that have that have gone into the waterways that are affecting people um, that are actually you know that are actually um, turning people uh, into um, into realized adults that they wouldn't otherwise have been absent the hormones in the water. Yep, I, I, I agree with all that. Uh, one, of the, one thing I would add is in the cultures where this is a recognized and accepted phenomenon, there are parameters where a person who is recognized to be in this category is effectively shunted into the role of the other sex for all purposes mm. right in, in other words you you know if you are a the equivalent of a trans woman then you marry as a woman and there are it's, i think it's absolutely fascinating why such a mechanism would exist but the fact that we've seen it many many times um suggests that it has a, a significance it's not it, yeah, I guess I'm not, um, I haven't tried looking at the anthropological literature to see how common it actually is. And I am not as compelled as I think you are that it is common as some people claim it is. I think it definitely exists in at least a few places, but I'm not sure that it is quite so common as all of that. All right. Well, I mean, I don't know what all that is. It, let's put it this way. If you've got... 10 examples of cultures where it exists and is long-standing as good enough for my purposes. Yeah, 10, 10 strikes me as um, an interesting number. It doesn't really sound like many, many times, but um, yeah. And I don't, I don't even know if the anthropology exists, honestly, you know, yep. and how, how would you do it now? Yeah. I, I don't, I don't think it can be done now. So it would have to have been done historically. And of course that would have been, then we'd have to interpret through the lens of anthropologists who, you know, had, you know, th that was, that was way beyond the pale, you know, homosexuality was beyond the pale. Most anthropologists having been male couldn't even talk to women at all because most of the receiving cultures, if they received at all, wouldn't talk to male anthropologists. So, you know, what, what we are going to be able to know for sure is going to be, um, unfortunately quite selective. Yes. People would be, uh, referencing the literature in the library, the L I E B R A R Y. Library? Yes. Who would be refer referencing the... those who would claim to study this? No. <laughs> no? No. All right. I think yes, but. Does, does transitioning appeal to our yearning for resurrection, altering the data in order to start anew? Retroactive continuity reboot. Um, I wouldn't go that far, but I would say I think there's almost no question that people have been handed, people have been betrayed by a society that has inflicted uh, important destructive compounds on them early in life has handed them a puzzle in terms of mating and dating that is unsolvable, has handed them 
a monotonous reality, has handed them schools that don't educate. Basically, the point is the number of reasons that you might feel radically ill at ease in the present are many. And people lashing about for answers. What is it that, you know, if you make the mistake of thinking that other people are doing all right, and it's just you who's suffering, something must be way, way, way off. Maybe it's my gender, right? It's not surprising, especially if there's some thing broadcasting that as an answer. You know what's wrong, it's your gender. Um, it's not surprising that people land on this and decide, maybe that's it, hopefully that's it, I can just change that. Well, I mean, I think that's all true, but I think we've also, we're also suffering from a loss of um, ceremony and ritual. Coming of age ceremonies almost don't happen anymore. And sort of modern era uh, opportunities to reinvent yourself don't really exist anymore either because social media. Yep. So there, there were many decades there of, of modern times where going off to college or going off to the army or going off to work if you were moving to a new town um, allowed you to try on something different. And now you go and everything that you've been doing on social media up until then follows you and it's expected to be continuous and it's obvious if you're suddenly a different human being. And so there aren't these really, you know, expected, predictable, I'm looking forward to it, I'm going to plan it, I'm not going to change yet, but then I'm going to try, I'm going to try to be more outgoing, I'm going to try, you know, whatever it is. People used to be able to do that and know that they were doing it and go for it. And now there's no escape from who you are unless you're like, actually, I'm not who I am. I'm not who I thought I was, I'm not who you thought I was, here I am, ta-da, I'm different. And so that does kind of feel like a resurrection in some ways. That's a really good point, which is you and I agree and have often said the lack of uh, rites of passage and things is a critical failure. Yeah. But the idea that in a vacuum of such things, you might invent your own, and then some force is out there, with, has a ready-made version of it. Hey, here's one. And everybody will understand it. And what's more, everybody will have to respect it because, right. you know, because right. there's a weapon that will punish those who don't. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. yeah, I think there's a, I think there's a lot to that. That this is a prepackaged and, in most cases, phony mechanism mm -hmm. for replacing something that our, uh, and it really is a Chesterton's fence kind of issue. We got rid of a bunch of things that were doing a whole hell of a lot of work. This goes exactly to Aaron Reich's point uh, in that piece you read, yep. right? That, you know, and I've made this point about uh, couple dancing, mm -hmm. right? We, this we used to serve a really important function and it is no longer, certainly not universal. It was rarely done really uh, in the West. And, um, Lo and behold, mating and dating is fucked up, right? Does the fact that we took this ritualized, you know, mating and dating playground and eliminated it in favor of something else and then mating and dating got fucked up, like maybe those two things have a relationship with each other. Yeah. Um, so anyway, yeah, I, I love your point here. I think people looking for that ability to... Um, to reinvent themselves and then having this one presented to them where there are no other options. That's a, that's a big piece of this puzzle. Yeah, I think it might be. How long have we been at it, Zach? Uh, about an hour and 10 minutes. An hour and 10 minutes. Let's do two more. All right. Regarding Sargon, the term you're looking for is manifest observable behavior. Mm -hmm. Would love to see him and Brett appear on each other's shows. That wasn't a question, so I'll do two more. That's interesting. I actually, and you know, I wasn't paying a lot of attention to him before, but felt like Patreon kind of won. They kind, of, they kind of, they kind of quieted him. Well, no, not him. Uh, I think it's not simple because Good. I think what happened to him is actually something that frequently happens, where. The world engages in what is tantamount to a negotiation with a problem person. Now, I don't consider Sargon a problem person, but right. something did. Right. And the point is, how would you like a deal 
where you are more prosperous and you are in charge of what you say and do, but the normies don't hear from you. Yeah. Right? And I think it is... You're not changing the conversation over in normie land. Right. And I think it does this to people again and again. And it's one of the reasons that it's very difficult to figure out what to do about something like YouTube or Twitter, which is going somewhere else, even if it increases your audience, may be agreeing to be neutralized. Yeah. Which is what the thing wants. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. 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 Uh, Was the Cluster Fact Festival transparently intended to hide the truth? (laughs) (laughs) I feel like that's... A question that doesn't need an answer. Um, So much noise. Does ivermectin really work? Love you guys. That's the final question for today. Does ivermectin really work? It works for a lot of things, including... Including um, COVID. Including prophylaxis and against and treatment for COVID. But you know what it doesn't work as well as? The propaganda that has thoroughly confused this issue. Yeah. Why do I say it works? I say it works because even the studies that are touted as suggesting it doesn't work, if you dig deeply, A, you see they were designed to fail. B, you see that their own authors actually acknowledge that the drug works behind the scenes before they publish a paper that says publicly it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the data and you analyze it independent of what is written in those papers, you also find an effect. So... Yep. It's clear that it works. It's also clear that it would be strange if it didn't And a lot work. of the world knows this. Right. And, and they, much of the world is not living under the absurd, uh, absurd in the absurd pharmaceutical landscape that we are. You yeah. can get it over the counter in many places, and people are doing that when they get COVID. Yep. Yeah. They are. And, yeah. you know, I guess the thing that is most fascinating to me is that we are the least well-informed people on earth about this, right? That we in the West, and in particular in the U.S., are suffering from the most intense propaganda. And so um, those of us who have the advantages of being from the West would be imagined to have better information. However noisy the information was, ours would be better. Nope, it's the exact inverse. Well, we do have fact-checking festivals, though. So uh, that, in, in in our defense... That's yes, fact-checking festivals headed by Fauci. Mm-hmm. Yep. P H A U C I. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Except that 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 presumes that there was an earlier Fauci spelled with an F that uh, was a was a more honorable one, and I'm not sure that's true. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I, I hope we ultimately do find out. It would be great. Yeah. All right. Well, that got grim. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe it's time for a virtual festival on some dry topic of our choosing Mm. to yes, make sure they're lighten the mood. There's neither there's music, not music, dancing, cocktails, anything. Right. Real real people to engage with. We want a festival that is limited to typing things, (laughs) things that adhere to a strict code that does not result in PayPal extracting thousands of dollars from your account because you've said $2,500 per infraction, you say. <laughs> per infraction. Oh, right? my Lord. Per infraction. Every time that you claim that uh, that um, Bruce Jenner mm, won the decathlon in Dead 19- naming is probably an infraction. Oh, of course it's an infraction. You wouldn't. There was no Bruce Jenner. There was never a Bruce Jenner. Wait. There was never a Bradley Manning. So, d- I, no one knows who won silver and bronze in the events that I Bruce think was stopped. Bruce won all of them. Stop. Sorry about that. <laughs> no one knows <laughs> who won silver and bronze in the events that Bruce Jenner won gold in. But given that Bruce Jenner apparently doesn't exist and never did, doesn't the guy who came in fourth actually need to be notified and get his medal and the guy who won silver needs to win gold and the guy who won bronze needs to win silver doesn't this i mean isn't that what needs to happen totally and if there's a women's decathlon then uh is it caitlin jenner is that the guy's name at this point i think so yeah Uh, incidentally caitlin jenner um is is 
good on this. Yeah, I was actually I was actually like, going to say Caitlyn Jenner it's... is actually really solid on this. Like I don't like I do not respect, frankly, the donning, the you know the hyper feminized and sexualized stuff of womanhood and saying that that is what makes you a woman. But Caitlyn Jenner, who presents as a woman and lives as a woman, uh, holds no truck with this like trans women should be playing against women in female sports and, and right. all of this is, is having none of it. So no, you know, more power to Caitlyn Jenner. More power to Caitlyn yeah. Jenner. I also was going to make the same point. I, this uh, Nobody's making fun of, of Caitlyn Jenner. Yeah. I, I'm making fun of the New York Times, which <laughs> can't figure out that Bradley Manning was the person well, who handed over documents to WikiLeaks. Right. But I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't, appreciate or respect. And I don't remember what crazy fashion magazine put Caitlyn Jenner on the cover post surgery. It was like Vogue or Cosmo or something, I, I think. And it was it was just, you know, hypersexualized. It's like, see, how can you object to this being a woman? Like, are, do we in fact live in the 50s? What happened? Like, when did we start celebrating hypersexualization of, sec of, of, of women bearing their secondary sex characteristics um some of which they bought in a store like what the hell uh it was an inevitable consequence of our eating our wheaties w-e-e-d-i-e-s <laughs> <laughs> was jenner one of the one of the was bruce jenner one of the guys like pitching wheaties back oh, in the hell 70s yeah was he yeah okay he interesting was, he was all over that Wheaties, but he box. was actually eating wheaties <laughs> no he wasn't eating wheaties the he people wasn't. who have decided that he is the ultimate woman they are eating Wheaties. All right, this has now gotten convoluted. I just don't know what to do. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> I just don't know what to do. It's welcome crazy. to that festival. Yeah, well, Tesla's got the right idea. He's going to stretch and he's going to consider lying back down. And then oh, he's on his other for side, that yep. side was done, and now he's. No, yep. no, yep. this side is. Oh, it's very toasty. Very yeah. nicely done. <laughs> yes, <laughs> well done. Okay, uh, we will see you. Next week. Not a week from now, but a week from tomorrow. We um, won't see them. They will see us. This thing I believe this is way. an expression that people use. It is. It is. It totally is. And every time I hear it, I think that's crazy. And then I say it. And then I think that's even crazier. And there we are. It sounds presumptuous. To say you will see us. I agree. It's that's obnoxious, terrible. right? Yep. I assume many of you will, and I appreciate how you about this? for doing so. But instead of saying you will see us, how about we start saying we won't see you next week? No. <laughs> You're trying to lose audience. No. You're on YouTube side now. <laughs> we got to do something. We'll see you never. How about that? Um, no. Uh, how about this? Okay. We'll see you next week. C-E-E-Y-O-U. As opposed to S-E-E, -E, which implies that we will actually see them. No. <laughs> Just no? No. I was, I was hoping you were going to be more forthcoming about what your imagined definition of C-E-E -E is. Um, C is the metaphorical C in which... We, it's already metaphorical. That's how it's being used. This is hyper metaphorical. It's just, all right. <laughs> I think we have now talked ourselves into a cul de sac. Mm, I think that was mostly you. Mm, I think I have now <laughs> talked ourselves into a cul de sac. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, eight days from now, we will be signing off and promising to see you again next time yeah as i am going to do right now we will see you again next week in the meantime be good to the ones you love eat good food and get outside